Welcome to this very special program designed to provide you, the listener, with clear and accurate information about the current state of the COVID-19 pandemic and what you and your family can do to protect themselves. I am Dr. Karen Wingfield, the Executive Director of the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance, an institution designed to bridge the strengths of Meharry Medical College, one of four historically black colleges in Nashville, Tennessee, with those of Vanderbilt University to model how community engagement can improve health literacy and empower individuals, families, and communities to advocate for and achieve health equity. The MVA is pleased to partner with the Vanderbilt Program and Disaster Research and Training to share this life-saving information about COVID-19. The COVID pandemic has highlighted the many inequities that exist in America that impact the health and well-being of communities of color. Tragically, over half a million Americans have died of COVID-related illnesses, and these deaths have disproportionately impacted Black and Brown communities. The pandemic has also raised awareness of the deficiencies of our healthcare system that impact those same marginalized communities and other populations, such as people living in rural settings. While there is hope for an end of the pandemic, with the daily number of new cases and deaths from COVID declining, we are not out of the woods yet. And there is still work to be done to ensure that things keep moving in the right direction. Joining me today is Dr. James Hildreth, President and CEO of Meharry Medical College. Dr. Hildreth, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Wingfield, for having me. I'm happy to be here. You know, Dr. Hildreth, most people in Nashville are very familiar with your work and your leadership role at Meharry, but might not be as familiar with your basic science background. Would you share a bit about your background with our viewers and listeners and explain how your expertise has been leveraged during the COVID-19 pandemic? So uh, thank you. Well, I started studying viruses and immunology as a junior at Harvard in 1977. And I was a chemistry major, but I did research related to how certain chemicals could activate cells in the immune system. I then went on to Oxford to do my PhD, where I studied the fundamental mechanisms by which we call them cytotoxic T cells, how they recognize virally infected cells. Um, and then after finishing my PhD, I came to Johns Hopkins for medical school. And during medical school, I continued my research in basic science and the immune system, again, focusing on how cells in the immune system recognize their targets. That's also when I started my work on HIV in 1986. And my work was focused on a very basic fundamental question. It still is that same question, which is the complexity of biological organisms is determined by how many genes they have, generally speaking. So human beings are quite complex organisms because we have 25,000 genes. HIV only has a handful of genes, yet its biology is more complex than viruses with much larger uh, chromosomes, much larger genomes than HIV does. So I've been trying to understand how virus with such a small genome can have such complex biology. So in a way, for the last 40 plus years, I've been doing basic research on how the immune system works, mm. particularly in the context of viruses. So obviously having a global epidemic or pandemic caused by a virus has allowed me to bring a lot of my research and knowledge uh, to, to the forefront in responding to it. So I feel very fortunate that my background was so so compatible with dealing with this with this yes. crisis. Yes. Now you've also been engaged with a lot of the different um, organizations that have been involved in development of the vaccines and in approval. Um, tell us a little bit about your work with the FDA, for example. So I was appointed to the vaccines and related biological products. We call it the VRPAC mm -hmm. at FDA. That's the committee that sees all the data from the trials and makes recommendations to FDA regarding whether or not approval should be granted. Um, I'm one of 22 experts that are on that committee. We review all the data with a focus on efficacy and safety. 
and we then make recommendations uh, for approval. And that was really based on my longstanding research in, H in HIV viruses generally and the immune response to viruses. So again, I felt really fortunate to be in a position to be on that committee because it's been a very important role to play. Um, it also gives me better standing when I speak to people about the vaccines being safe and effective. Having seen all the data for myself, it it's made a tremendous difference. Yes, yes, that, that has to be um, an amazing uh, privilege to really go through and look at the data um, so that you can speak uh, with authority <laughs> about its safety and efficacy. Now, there have been three vaccines that are currently approved by the FDA. Um, can you just share with folks a little bit about the difference between the three different vaccines? Sure. The, the vaccines that are currently, uh, that, that have been granted EU, EUAs and the others that are in the pipeline are based on three different platforms. We call them platforms. The first is we just take a piece of the virus, we purify it, in this case, the spike protein. And the spike protein is the protein on the surface of the virus that allows it to gain entry into our cells. So we take that protein, we purify it, we mix it with a substance called an adjuvant to really boost the immune response. And we inject that directly into individuals. Novavax and Sanofi, we're using that platform. The second platform is we take a common cold virus, we inactivate it so it cannot replicate. We then modify the genome of that virus to include a gene from SARS-CoV-2, in this case, the gene for the spike protein. And now what happens is when you get injected with this dead virus, it delivers the gene for the spike protein into your cells. You make the protein the immune system response. That's AstraZeneca and, and uh, j, j the third platform is messenger RNA. Messenger, messenger RNAs are like the working blueprints for proteins. The permanent blueprints for our proteins are the DNA in, in our genomes, but the working blueprint for the proteins are the mRNA. So they, they are the ones responsible for telling the machinery how to stitch the amino acids together to make a protein. Anyway, the, the two... <laughs> The two vaccines that were earliest across the finish line were Pfizer and Moderna. They're using mRNA technology. Um, and again, we package the mRNA in a lipid capsule. It's a little capsule made out of lipids. We inject that into the muscle cells um, in our upper arm here. And the mRNA goes into the cells. It makes the protein and goes with the protein. We respond to it. So all of the vaccine have a singular purpose to bring the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 to the attention of our immune system. We make antibodies to it, and those are meant to protect us. So the major differences between the vaccines are the platforms, mm -hmm. but interestingly, they're all using the same target. They all use the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2. And the idea is that if you make antibodies to the spike protein, they will coat the virus and it won't be able to get into our cells. We call those neutralizing antibodies. Yeah. So those are the three platforms that are being used for vaccine. That's, that's great. And, and, you know, I think a lot of people are mistaken and they think that coronaviruses are new. They are not. <laughs> They've been a family that has been around, of viruses that have been around for decades, at least that we've known of. I'm sure probably even go far beyond that. And so the variant that you're mentioning, the SARS-CoV-2, is really the name of this particular uh, coronavirus. And is there anything that makes this particular variant a little bit more special that you know of? Sure. So um, there are more than 35 viruses in the coronavirus family. They're endemic to bats. And what normally happens is bats are mammals, of course. They transfer the virus to other mammals that humans may come into contact with. Mm -hmm. A great example of that is the MERS uh, pandemic that happened in 2012. You only got that virus if you came into contact with an infected camel, for example. Hmm. The difference between MERS and the original SARS from 2003 is animals were the vectors and we call that a zoonotic infection when the virus jumps from one species into another. So when the virus jumped from camels or privets into humans, those are zoonotic transmissions. And those pandemics tend to be more limited because again, 
you only get the virus if you come into contact with those animals. The difference between those two coronaviruses and SARS-CoV-2 is when it got into humans, it adopted for human to human transmission mm -hmm. and we became the vector. So humans are the vector for this virus. And that's why it spread around the globe so yeah, quickly. So quickly. Because the virus went along with where the humans went. So that's the main difference between uh, those viruses. And people need to know that we call the disease COVID-19, but the virus that causes the disease is SARS-CoV-2. Yes, thank you for that. So just to be clear, you know, there are three FDA approved vaccines. There's the, the Pfizer and Moderna, which are both the mRNA platform. I actually uh, received and have completed both injections of the Pfizer vaccine um, really? and had very little side effects. The first injection, I had none. Uh, the second injection, I had a little bit of just kind of feeling off and feeling tired the next day. Have you heard about uh, significant side effects from people who are getting any of the vaccines? You've got, again, Pfizer, Moderna, and then obviously the J&J, &J, which is the adenovirus um, version of this uh, vaccine. Yeah, so all told now, as we sit and talk about this, more than 380 million people around the world have been given one of the vaccines, including the AstraZeneca, which is being used in, in some places. The most severe uh, reaction that we've seen is a severe allergic reaction. Mm -hmm. And that is, is occurring at one in four million to one in six million people. Uh, those individuals get treated for the allergic response and they do fine. So there really have not been any really significant allergic reactions besides that. I mean, be reactions besides that. Uh, but some people may note that the second injection, as you did, Dr. Wingfield, gives you a more significant response than the first one. Mm -hmm. And that is not unexpected since human beings have never had never experienced this virus before. Last November of, of actually November of 2019 mm -hmm. is the first time that we ever saw the virus. So humans were completely naive from an immunological point of view to the virus. So we make what's called a primary immune response. Those are, you know, moderate. We make some antibodies and last for a few weeks. But the second time you see that same thing, you make a secondary immune response. And that one can be a thousand fold to 10,000 fold stronger. And that's why for some people getting the second injection causes a much more, much stronger reaction because it reflects the fact that the immune system has made such a stronger reaction to it. And keep in mind that the most typical side effects reflect the fact that your immune system has been activated. The, the fever, the fatigue, sometimes that people feel muscle aches, all those things, some of them, most of them are related to the immune system doing what it does. Yeah, I just figured it means it's working. <laughs> that's the way I, that's the way I looked at it. Um, mm -hmm. And again, very mild and, and very few symptoms and they went away pretty quickly. Now, the J&J &J vaccine is a single dose vaccine and there's some concern that um, there's going to not be um, appropriate rollout in terms of making sure other, they're gonna say, oh, the Pfizer is better or the Moderna is better. And you know, the J&J &J is just not as good. Can you speak to that just briefly? Sure. So unfortunately, the media latched on to the top line result, which is that overall, if efficacy was 66% or so. What they didn't focus on was the most important thing, which is this vaccine proved to be 100% effective against severe disease hospitalization. And very importantly, no one who got the vaccine died of COVID-19. So in terms of why we <laughs> started out to make the vaccines in the first place, this vaccine does exactly what we needed to do, which is to keep people from getting really sick, keep them out of the hospital, and keep them from dying. So yeah. this is not an inferior vaccine by any means. That's great, thank you for that. You know, as, as you know, I'm helping to co-lead the inclusive participation work group for the National Institutes of Health, their Community Engaged Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities. And mm -hmm. we actually heard some alarming details about vaccine uptake, um, mm -hmm. where there's actually significant numbers of individuals who are declining the vaccine, even though they're eligible. Can you actually share, spread some, you know, shed some light on that for us? Well, there have been a number of uh, reasons that I've heard 
some of them directly from people who've asked me questions, why people are hesitant or reluctant to take the vaccine. Certainly among people of color, there's a, there's a rationale for it that goes way back to 1619 in my opinion. But I need people to understand a few things. First of all, with more than 350 million people now being vaccinated, they're not gonna be guinea pigs because there've been so many people to get the vaccine. We know that all of them appear to be really, really safe. So that's the first thing. The other thing is a concern about whether or not uh, persons of color have been represented in the vaccine trials. And Pfizer and Moderna did a reasonable job where 10% of the participants were black, mm -hmm. uh, about 20 plus percent were Hispanic. Yep. But more importantly, in all of the vaccine trials, an effort was made and a successful effort was made to include individuals who were older and also those who had uh, chronic conditions. Mm -hmm. And the vaccines proved to be effective in all those groups, blacks, whites, older individuals, individuals with underlying conditions. Um, so we know that they work in the people who know, most need them. The other thing to point out to people, who, especially people of color, is that unlike past research, uh, biomedical research, African-Americans have been a part of COVID-19 vaccine development at every stage, including a brilliant black woman at NIH, Dr. Kismigia Corbett, whose research played a critical role in developing the mRNA vaccine platform. Then there's something called a data safety monitoring board. These are independent groups of experts and patient advocates who get to see the trial data as it accumulates. And if they see what is called a safety signal where people are being harmed or there's undue harm, they have the authority to shut the, the trial down until we figure things out. And there have been a number of pe persons of color who've been parts of the data sector monitoring boards. Then finally, when the vaccine data has been accumulated, presented to the FDA, an independent group of experts, the VRPAC, as I mentioned earlier, reviews the data. I myself, as an African-American and one of my colleagues at University of Michigan, Dr. Avita Fuller, we're both on that committee. So unlike past research, medical research, in this case, we know definitively that persons of color have been involved mm. at every step of the way, and that's very different. So I would say to those who are concerned about uh, how the trials were conducted, whether or not the you know minorities were, were represented, and what's been our involvement on the other side of the table, so to speak, all those things are favorable, and I don't see any reason why anyone should not take these vaccines. Because the alternative is people will die, and we want to keep that from happening. Right, right. And as, as noted already, I mean, the deaths are already disproportionately impacting communities of color. Yes. However, let's be clear, it's not just communities of color that are declining. And in fact, there is some data to suggest that a third of the mil military that's been offered uh, the vaccine have declined and almost a quarter of healthcare workers who are eligible have declined. And, you know, from my perspective, look, I'm a practicing clinician and, you know, I certainly feel like it's important for me as a provider to not only just set the example, but there's some safety around that as well. I mean, can you speak to healthcare providers and say, you know, in, in your opinion, why is it important for uh, healthcare workers to consider uh, taking um, the vaccine? Well, Dr. Winkfield, as you know, uh, there are certain vaccines that are mandatory if you're gonna interact with, with patients. And the reason why they are is that we wanna protect the healthcare workers themselves, but also the patients that they come into contact with. The last thing we'd ever wanna see is for someone to come and seek um, medical care or healthcare and get an infection from the individuals providing the care. So the, the importance of getting healthcare workers uh, vaccinated works in both ways. We wanna protect them, because they're providing essential care to people who may be infected. We never want the healthcare workers to, to be at undue risk in doing what we want them to do, what we need them to do. So getting healthcare workers immunized or vaccinated is important because we want to protect them, but also protect the patients um, that they, they're caring for. And I need to make a very important point, which is the three vaccines that are currently being used in the United States 
have been granted an EUA, emergency use authorization. That's very different from full approval by the FDA. And what that means is no one can mandate that anyone take these vaccines because they don't have full approval. Uh, that will come later. But because we're in a national crisis, a pandemic, the FDA has the authority to grant approval for vaccines for emergency use as long as there is a reasonable expectation that they will work and that they're safe. And I can just say quite definitively, all three of these vaccine candidates met that criteria very easily. They're certainly very effective and they were very safe. And so that's why they were granted emergency use authorization, but they cannot be mandated because they're not fully approved. But as soon as one of these is granted full approval at that point, like other vaccines that are mandatory, this one can be manda mandated for people who provide care to the public. But that's a very important distinction. That people yes. Have. Yeah, thank you. Because I, I was wondering <laughs> why wasn't it mandated, but that makes a whole lot of sense. So thank you for that. You know, you were recently appointed to President Biden's COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. Can you just briefly describe what the purpose of that task force is? So I'm really excited about this, Dr. Wingfield. I'm excited that we have a president who has acknowledged uh, that there is a huge chasm in the health status of persons of color and disadvantaged communities here in the United States. And the COVID-19 <clears throat> pandemic, excuse me, the pandemic shone a very bright light on this situation. These, the, <laughs> the reason why African-Americans and Hispanics have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 is because they have an undue burden of hypertension, asthma, uh, lung disease, heart disease. Uh, they're much more likely to be obese. All of those things make persons much more likely to get really sick from COVID-19 and to die. So President Biden has decided that he wants to make sure that the federal government does all it can do to, to, to narrow the gap between minorities and whites in terms of COVID-19 disease, but also in the longer term, how do we eliminate those disparities that cause the, the disproportionate burden of disease in the first place? So the charge to the Health, Health Equity Task Force is to make recommendations to the president and the federal agencies about what they can do to make sure that COVID-19 resources are distributed equitably. Um, and in my opinion, that means that we focus on the most vulnerable populations because that allows us to save the most lives. Mm -hmm. We also are, are charged with coming up ways to, better ways to culturally, <laughs> being culturally aware, how do we communicate with different populations to make sure they understand the, the, the disease itself, the vaccines that are available, to make sure they understand the treatments that are available. So communication is a key part of what we're gonna do. And then the, 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 the third major charge is, what are some long-term uh, policies and laws that might be enacted to narrow the gap in the health status of Americans? So those are the three big things that we've been asked to focus on. Our charge is to come up with these recommendations and as quickly as possible, get them to the president for his consideration. That is absolutely fantastic. Um, so excited that you're a part of that. Uh, you know, I, it, it's good to know that it won't just be focused on COVID, right? That it really does sound as if this committee is being tasked with, you know, thinking more broadly about healthcare um, and what we might need to do to help kind of relieve and um, to close up some of these gaps. So that's great. So Dr. Hildreth, we are coming to the end of this program. And, you know, I think it's, I'm just grateful for your time, number one, but you've imparted some very amazing information and hopefully our listeners and, and viewers will take these things to heart. But do you have any last um, words of wisdom uh, that you would like to impart uh, to folks? Just a, just a couple of thoughts. First of all, I need people to really understand what an amazing scientific achievement it is that here in March of 2021, after a pandemic was declared in uh, last uh, March, that we have hundreds of millions of people around the world 
being injected with safe vaccines. It has to be one of the greatest uh, scientific achievements, certainly in my lifetime. People need to understand that. The second thing is that we are not out of the woods. And until 80% of us in the United States are immune, either through vaccination or confirmed immunity after recovering, we still got work to do. And, you know, noting, noting the crowds on beaches for spring break and the crowded restaurants, I'm very nervous. And I just want people to know that we still have work to do. The variants that are emerging are very concerning. Some of them appear to be more um, more contagious and maybe even cause more severe disease. So I would just plead with everyone, let's stay focused on wearing our mask, keeping our distance and doing those things to protect ourselves until we're through with this. And we have some more work to do and that, that's, that's what I would like to, for people to know and consider. There's still work to do. Yes. <laughs> we're going to put this behind us, but we still got work to do. Yes, yes, yes. So thank you for that. So keep wearing your mask, folks. Keep washing your hands. Keep staying socially distanced as best as possible. And please, please, please consider getting vaccinated. Yes. Well, Dr. Hildreth, this has been a fabulous um, opportunity to just kind of pick your brain a little bit. So thank you so much. And, you know, on behalf of Drs. Michael Freeman and, and Dr. John Walsh, who are co-directors of the Vanderbilt Program in Disaster Research and Training, and on behalf of the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance. I just want to thank you so much for your time and expertise. We are so lucky to have you right here in Nashville, and I hope everyone, especially individuals who are working in the healthcare setting, will really consider um, getting vaccinated. It doesn't matter if you're working in the clinic, in the hospital, in a care facility. Please, please, please think about not only yourself and your families, but also the people that you take care of. Our communities are counting on you to help end this battle with COVID-19. So thank you so much. Thank you.